Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, uh, let me make a, a, a well, a few announcements. Um, first, uh, well, mainly the uh, big thing still happening is COVID, of course. Um, so we're into the summer. This is now uh, 15 odd months, um, and uh, things are continuing to be improving, but extremely gradually. Um, and uh, also with some warning signs on the horizon in terms of the Delta variant or, or variants that could emerge as a result of the uh, large numbers of still unvaccinated people, which provide a, a medium for the virus to, to mutate. Um, so uh, it's unfortunate, but this is you know, dragging on, um, although it is getting better. And, the benchmark that I've used in trying to describe, uh, you know, that has been the, the infection rate in the hospital, um, which at its uh, zenith back in April of um, of 2020 uh, was 2,000, um, and now is uh, 70. Um, but the decline is, you know, down uh, single digits. And then for several consecutive days, then up a, a couple of digits. So it's um, declining, but it's not uh, you know, disappearing completely. Um, so uh, first thing is everybody has to be vaccinated. Um, and that's a mandatory requirement by the hospital and the university, although the state has not uh, done that, but we are strongly encouraging it. The second thing is we're still maintaining some infection control procedures in terms of masking, social distancing, uh, temperature uh, monitoring, et cetera. Um, and we still have our uh, walk-in rapid testing uh, facility or capacity on the first floor um, uh, available. Uh, so as we kind of inch our way towards uh, what we hope is normalization, we're determining what that will be uh, in terms of um, the possibility of telecommuting, uh, the um, continued need for any type of uh, infection control, uh, any further need for booster vaccinations or, or supplemental um, vaccination with um, a, 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 viral, a viral vaccine like J&J &J in combination with a, a mRNA vaccine which is currently being discussed, but no opinion yet uh, rendered. Um, so uh, we have a new class of students, of trainees. Um, we have more people in the buildings than uh, previously, but it's still a far cry from what usually was the case before this happened. Um, and uh, hopefully it'll continue to increase. So um, if people have questions about what's going to happen, what they should be doing, uh, your division director, your service chief, your laboratory head should be communicating that. And that's communicated on a regular basis by uh, the relevant vice chairs to the, um, uh, the constituent leadership. Um, our grand round schedule is going to continue through July. Uh, before I introduce our speaker today, I'll mention that next week, uh, July 14th, It'll be a talk by Thomas Post from the um, University of Montreal, uh, Martin Picard's uh, hometown. Um, and it'll be on population neuroscience of the developing brain. Um, and then June 21st or July 21st is gonna be June Jackson Christmas Memorial Lecture or honor, not memorial, honorary lecture uh, given by three people, uh, Ayana Jordan, Utibe Essin and Araka Bath. Um, and it'll be on uh, communities of color and mental health services and diversity populations. And then the last one on uh, July 28th will be Chana Sachs uh, from MGH uh, on gun violence pre prevention and mental illness. Um, well, it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Robert uh, Sweet. Um, to, Robert is a native New Yorker, grew up in Oceanside, New York. Uh, he went to undergraduate school at Rensselaer Polytech upstate and then uh, his medical degree at Albany Medical College. Um, oh, no, he started there and then he transferred to Maryland. Is that correct? Yep. And received his MD at the University of Maryland, but he 
came back uh, to New York and uh, trained at Albany Medical College uh, affiliate uh, teaching hospital uh, and remained uh, on faculty until 1990 when he was recruited to the University of Pittsburgh. Um, in addition to general psychiatric training, uh, uh, do you prefer to call Bob or Rob or Robert? Uh, as long as it's polite, I'm indifferent, but Rob typically. Okay, but Rob um, uh, uh, received a, a geriatric training and certification, so he's a full-fledged geriatric psychiatrist. Um, and over the course of his career, he's uh, evolved and ascended. Uh, uh, he's the um, UPMC Endowed Professor of Psychiatric Neuroscience uh, at the um, University of Pittsburgh. He's also a professor of neurology at Pittsburgh, and he's the director of the clinical core of the University of Pittsburgh Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And he directs an NIMH funded postdoctoral training emphasizing translational neuroscience research. Um, Rob began his career as a geriatric psychiatrist studying psychopharmacology, but uh, as the field of uh, psychiatry evolved in terms of its uh, uh, integration of the basic neuroscience disciplines, uh, he expanded beyond clinical psychopharmacology to um, the neurobiology, neuropathology, and molecular neurobiology of uh, brain disorders, particularly degenerative brain disorders, uh, and began working uh, with postmortem tissue to some degree with um, uh, subhuman primate tissue uh, and uh, studies the mechanisms of disease as well as um, therapeutic approaches to treat the uh, disease. So it's a pleasure to have him uh, with us today and to talk about uh, a topic that is from a demographic standpoint increasingly important, which pertains to the aging brain and the diseases that ail it. So uh, Bob, we're looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction uh, and uh, the invitation to be here, uh, at least virtually, and get to talk to everyone. I'm going to just, uh, if you would just confirm that you can uh, see my screen and the pointer. Yep, the we pointer can see it. Great. All right. So I'm going to be talking today about one of the things my lab does, which is studying mechanisms of psychosis and Alzheimer's disease. Um, uh, I like to put this slide up um, for a couple of reasons. One, to tell you something about myself, uh, which is that I'm a fairly uh, enthusiastic uh, biker, mostly mountain biker, but also because this slide really tells you everything you need to know clinically about psychosis and Alzheimer's disease. Um, and what if you look carefully, while well, your eyes will first be drawn to the uh, Tour de France uh, peloton going up the Alpe d'Huez, you might notice this guy up here, uh, the mountain biker Dave Watson, who waited till they were under underfoot and then launched himself over the the tour. And so, what has this got to do with uh, psychosis and Alzheimer's disease? Um, one might say he might have had some delusions here, or, uh, but here's what it's got to do. You'll notice his trajectory, right? It's a rapidly downhill trajectory, which is what's true of people who develop in psychosis and Alzheimer's disease. They, they decline much more rapidly than, than the individuals who don't develop psychosis. And importantly, if you look down here in the bottom left corner, perhaps you'll notice that he has a bad outcome um, as he crashed off the bike signal. And that, that too is true for psychosis and Alzheimer's disease. So that'll be the clinical theme of what we'll talk about today. Um, I need to let you know if the, my slides will advance. Um, uh, thank you. Um, sorry, uh, that I have no conflicts to disclose regarding the work I'm gonna to present today. So what am I going to talk about specifically? So Rob, talk uh, Rob uh, I told Rob that he nobody would interrupt him during his talk, but uh, I'll, I'll reserve the chairman's prerogative. Okay. So you, you said those people that develop psychosis in the context of their Alzheimer's, uh, doesn't if, if they live long enough, doesn't everybody eventually? No, no. It, the, the upper estimates are not clear. Most people put it at somewhere between uh, around 60%, it's possible it goes as high as 70 or 80%. So in some sense, it's not everyone, uh, but most of it, as I talk about this now, we're probably talking about the people who develop it through somewhere in the earlier middle stages. It's, it's what I'm about to say is less relevant to people who only develop it in the most end stage of disease. Um, so, uh, all right, so let's talk, uh, then I'll talk uh, today a little bit about the, what I just told you, which is both 
uh, how frequent psychosis is, when it occurs, and what the, some of the correlates of that phenotype are. Then I will discuss uh, some of our work, genetic work, that uh, indicates that this question of whether you're likely to get or not get psychotic during your Alzheimer's disease is to a large extent genetically determined. And we'll look at um, issues about uh, synaptic protein levels and their post-transcription mechanisms that contribute to changes in synaptic protein levels and their role in producing risk for psychosis in Alzheimer's disease. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about how some emerging data may suggest that there's oligodendrocytic changes that relate in some way to the risk for psychosis in Alzheimer's disease. So just to give you background, obviously, I think everyone is pretty aware of the uh, problem of Alzheimer's disease in the US today, right? The silver tsunami is upon us. Our rapidly aging population means that these numbers are gonna go up fast. But when, I, when I last surveyed these facts and figures, these are the numbers, more than 5 million Americans with Alzheimer's disease, uh, hundreds of billions in annual costs, not to mention all the unpaid caregivers that contribute to costs. And then Alzheimer's disease was the sixth leading cause of death. And one of the few of the top causes of death where the rates are going up, not down. So when I talk about psychotic symptoms in Alzheimer's disease, what am I referring to? Um, there are several categories of psychotic symptoms. Um, of course, a psychiatrist will be familiar with most of these from work in general adult psychiatry. Uh, delusions of that are persecutory in nature, uh, jealous delusions or delusions of abandonment, like that your family is going to put you away in a nursing home and leave you are not uncommon. Uh, hallucinations are much less common, and when they are present, are more likely to be visual than in other modalities, though all modalities are possible. Um, but there's this other group of delusions that are not persecutory so much in nature, what are called the misidentification delusions. So believing that individuals are someone other than who they really are. Um, not recognizing your house and believing that you're someplace else when you're home. Uh, believing there are individuals in the house that are not there. Um, TV is real, because this one was named before there was reality TV, but what it refers to is the idea that the people you're seeing on the TV are really there in the house and can speak with you and interact with you. Delusions of someone being replaced by an imposter, so this would be a kind of classic Capgrass syndrome type of idea. Uh, delusions that people that you've known to have been dead for many years, like your parents who've been deceased for 30 years, are still alive and need to, to see you. Uh, obviously, there are some things that are different about these than in schizophrenia. For one, uh, people with Alzheimer's disease have memory impairments, so they often don't remember their delusional content from moment to moment. Uh, so when you ask them, they may not report it, but it keeps recurring. They keep bringing it up again and again over time from day to day with their family. So you often need the family to report to you how that these are occurring, that they're occurring frequently. That creates another problem that family are not experts in psychiatric assessment. So sometimes they get confused about whether someone, for example, is seeing people in their house that are not there or just believes there to be people that are not there but has never actually seen them. So there can be some things that are difficult to discern here. Rob, yes. are these, um, are the uh, non-conventional meaning non-conventional compared to schizophrenia or uh, um, affective psychosis, psychotic symptoms on the column on the right. Are those uh, specific to AD or do they occur in FTD or cerebrovascular dementia too? They, they, they will occur in other disorders uh, with cognitive impairment. Um, these are not, it, the data on how common psychotic symptoms are across the degenerative dementias is not entirely clear, but it would seem that they're certainly frequent in all other degenerative dementias, whether they are increased in any of them relative to Alzheimer's disease is a little fuzzy though. Visual hallucinations will be, are clearly a higher frequency in people who have dementia due, due to Lewy body disease. So, uh, so even, even, even though those are known to occur, you wouldn't, uh, they would uh, in no way be considered pathognomonic. Correct, that, that is correct. Um, the, uh, and they're, they tend to be a little different from schizophrenia or other psych, uh, young, you know, early life psychosis in other ways and that they are more likely uh, to be non-bizarre. Uh, and so you can imagine, for example, uh, an important consideration in assessing that an elderly person is delusional when they complain that their children are stealing from them is that you have to make sure the children aren't actually stealing from them. Uh, this does come up. And so you need to carefully, because in non-bizarre, you have to really check out the facts sometimes. So some are pretty obvious, like believing their parents are still alive. Uh, for example. 
Um, all right. I do not know why my slide does not want to advance. Let's try that. Okay. So when psychosis is present in an individual with Alzheimer's disease, it's a marker for a more severe phenotype. There are a lot of studies I, I cited here, a review we did, but there are many, many studies behind each of these points. Many of them were done uh, at Columbia by Dr. Stern, Devin and uh, Huey, others, um, that show that psychotic symptoms when present are indicative of individuals have greater cognitive impairment than other indivi than non-psychotic individuals with Alzheimer's disease who have been ill for a similar period of time. When you follow them prospectively, they have more rapid cognitive and functional deterioration. So they're going downhill more rapidly. Not surprisingly then, they're more likely to be institutionalized uh, sooner. And they, though the data on mortality is somewhat um, inconsistent, they seem more likely to die sooner. They are definitely more likely to have, in addition to the psychotic symptoms, aggressive behaviors and actually depressive symptoms as well. Uh, again, also not surprising that when these symptoms are present, they cause a lot of increased family distress. While it's obviously distressing for family to watch the sort of slow fade of their loved one um, due to Alzheimer's disease, if in the absence of psychosis, they often can maintain a perfectly um, you know, uh, affectionate and close relationship with the individual for much of the disease in the presence of psychosis, often that relationship gets disrupted if the individual no longer recognizes them, believes them to be some other person, accuses them of, uh, of harm, uh, of attempting to harm them, it can really distress and disrupt that family relationship. And finally, uh, as we know from a number of studies, while this is a disorder that uh, can uh, respond somewhat to antipsychotic medications uh, or antidepressant medications, the, the responses are fairly limited and they're usually not sufficient to eradicate the syndrome. So I told you it was frequent um, and most estimates say that the, the uh, put the, the cumulative incidence in the 40 to 60% range. This is a study we did at our Alzheimer's disease research center where people entered a time zero with either mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease and then progress through their cognitive disorder over multiple years of follow-up. And this is the frequency uh, incidence of psychosis. And you can see that over the first five years is roughly a 10% per year incidence we saw. And then it starts to level off. And in our case, we flattened off around 60% uh, over time in the study. Like I said, 40 to 60 is a pretty common kind of estimate. So I will say something that one should point out about this, because this incidence is progressive, it's 10% per year, there is time potentially to intervene early in the course to prevent psychosis, not just to treat it, if we could identify sources of resilience. All right, so we took advantage of some data sets now almost 20 years ago to report the first evidence that the presence of psychosis in Alzheimer's disease individuals was familial or her and heritable, it runs in families, and therefore is likely to be under genetic control. So the first study we reported was a group of families, 371 families recruited by the NIMH. So in those families were elderly, mostly siblings, who had all multiple ones of whom had Alzheimer's disease. So there were 461 pairs of siblings um, who had Alzheimer's disease. And what we asked is if the first sibling in the group has psychosis during the Alzheimer's disease, what's the odds that the, that the subsequent sibling will have psychosis? The answer was a, an odds ratio of about three, which was highly significant. We since um, that study or that approach was replicated by a group in the UK in a much smaller data set, um, which came to a similar estimate, also significant a fourfold increase in odds. And then we replicated again in a separate data set, the NIA load family study, uh, collection uh, led by actually Richard Mayu, the chair uh, of neurology uh, at Columbia. And so again, uh, almost a fourfold increase in odds that was significant. The, when we used the two larger data sets, NIMH and NIA, to estimate the heritability of psychosis, the, we saw about a 60 to 61% heritability of psychosis in AD. So given that you get AD, the heritability of then subsequently getting psychosis was at that 60 to 61%. That compares fairly favorably to the heritability estimates, say for schizophrenia, which usually are around 70%, uh, 
um, or for AD itself, which are often in the 70 to 75% range. So it's a fair, it's a highly heritable phenotype within conditional upon getting Alzheimer's disease. So then we took advantage of that over the subsequent years to conduct a number of genetic studies, as have others, looking at the association of um, psychosis and Alzheimer's disease with, with a variety of uh, typically common variants. What I want to tell you about all those studies done by us and done by others prior to the study I'm going to present here, which was just published in molecular psychiatry, is that they're all substantially flawed methodologically. They suffered from one or both of two uh, significant problems. One was most of those studies were um, candidate genes. In other words, they did not adequately survey the entire genome, nor did they control for the multiple testing required uh, across the genome. And the uh, second major flaw is that they were way, way underpowered. They were varied from hundreds to occasionally a thousand or two subjects, which are just underpowered to detect um, consistent and likely uh, replicable common genetic associations. This is the first such study, I believe, that's out there now. It was just published. And so what did we do? We took individuals who had possible, probable, or definite, definite meaning autopsy confirmed Alzheimer's disease. We defined the presence of psychosis, and I use this abbreviation AD plus P for plus psychosis, and the opposite minus P for, non, for minus psychosis or non-psychotic throughout. So you'll see that again. Uh, we defined psychosis as we did in our heritability studies as the presence of delusion, delusions and or hallucinations at some point during the course of the illness. Um, and at different source, we, we combined data from a number of different uh, cohorts across the globe, and they use different measures to measure psychotic symptoms in, in their subjects that are listed here. Um, so what did we require? To be defined as with psychosis, you had to have delusions or hallucinations at any of these assessment time points. To be considered AD without psychosis, you had to meet two criteria. First, the absence of psychotic symptoms at all assessment points. Um, and the second was that you had to have at least achieved some level of severity to indicate you were entering sort of the middle stages of, you'd enter the middle stages of disease. So a mini mental state exam score, I'm sorry, uh, uh, less than 20. So if your mini mental was greater than 20 or your clinical dementia rating score was less than one, you were still in early stages of disease. And we thought you had too much of a chance of being a false negative, meaning that had we followed you longer, you might've shown psychosis later. So we excluded those people from analysis. And all these people were uh, genotyped in a variety of different SNP arrays that we uh, imputed and aligned. And after uh, quality control measures to about 7 million SNPs across the genome. And then of course we obtained these data sets as separate groups. We meta-analyzed um, the data sets as we got them in to create one global then measure association. So who are the subjects? Um, these are the different cohorts, the, uh, this group from the Fundacio ASE and related uh, studies in uh, Barcelona, Catalonia, Spain. These are individuals from Alzheimer's disease centers from across the United States. This was a cohort recruited by Lilly for a pharmacotherapy trial of, uh, of, in Alzheimer's disease. This was the NIA late onset Alzheimer's disease families uh, collected. Uh, by Dr. Mayu. These were the families I previously mentioned collected at NIMH. These were our ADRC um, participants. These were a group of uh, participants from sites in the UK associated uh, with the GRAD study, mostly out of uh, Cardiff. And then this is a group of sites across um, Norway, most predominantly Norway and uh, uh, UK, Exeter in the UK, though also other sites across Europe that were compiled by collaborator uh, in the UK, Byron Kreese and Clive. Um, and uh, that in total then, we had non-psychotic subjects, almost 7,000, over 5,000 psychotic subjects, you can see the percentages, and over 12,000 subjects in total, which is a modestly powered genome-wide association study. Not a, uh, those of you familiar with these similar studies in schizophrenia know that like, uh, we're getting up into the hundreds of thousands or over 100 in any event in as we move along. So 
Um, what were the characteristics of the individuals in the, in the non-psychotic and the psychotic groups? They're presented here. Um, there wasn't an, the intent wasn't to match them on these uh, factors, but I'm just presenting that they are mo least important, most importantly, reasonably well aligned on uh, cognitive stage that they've reached, whether defined by mini mental score or their CDR. Um, uh, different proportion of females, you'll see that there's some increased risk for, in females for psychosis in this cohort. So when we analyzed those um, 7 million SNPs across the genome for their association with psychosis, this is what uh, we see. Um, so just to lay this out for you, on the x-axis here is what would be the expected um, p-value distribution under the null hypothesis. Um, on the y-axis are the observed p-values we observe for the 7 million SNPs. Each data point here on black is one of the, is a SNP p-value and the dashed line is the unity line. So if we have smaller p-values, i.e. more significance than expected, we see a deflection up above this line, which is what we saw. So we can see there's substantial evidence in our data set for an excess of small p-values, uh, which tells me that as uh, we grow the data set beyond 12,000 to larger numbers, we'll continue to see more and more SNPs that cross a threshold of genome-wide significance. Um, but this is ones that cross that levels at this point. So here's a Manhattan plot. I suspect many of you are familiar with this. Uh, along the x-axis in alternating colors are each of the autosomal chromosomes and then the X chromosome. Um, the Y axis again is the uh, negative log 10 of the P value. So higher values are more, are smaller P values are more significant. The dashed line is the criteria for genome wide significance. So you can see that we have two loci, one on chromosome three and another on chromosome four that pass that threshold for genome wide significance. Uh, in addition, there are a lot of other SNPs that are in an interesting range, say between 10 to the minus four and uh, five times 10 to the minus eight here that presumably contain that next, within them, that next cohort of SNPs to some extent that, will, that would become significant as we expand the sample size. So let's look at those two loci where we had genome-wide significance in some more detail. So first on chromosome three, uh, let me explain this plot to you. This is uh, the x-axis indicates uh, the position in physical space along the chromosome and megabase uh, uh, is the unit. Um, the y-axis is the significance of the SNP. So you can see we have this peak here that jumps above our genome-wide significance threshold. This is our best SNP at the top here. And then the other SNPs are color-coded by their degree of linkage disequilibrium, essentially correlation to that SNP. So you can see that there is a locus about this wide of SNPs. So somewhere in here is where the action is, appears to be coming from. That sits um, on top of a, uh, a variant, a, a particular transcript for the gene SUMF1. Um, it also sits upstream, five prime to this gene, LRN1. The second peak, same, uh, same design here of the, of the uh, plot, um, and you can see that there's a peak here of uh, our lead SNP and a number of what we call LD friends, SNPs that are uh, in linkage, dis linkage disequilibrium with it. And they sit in tronic to this gene, EMPP6, uh, between a couple of the um, five prime exons. We were not able to identify any definitive functions, molecular functions of any of these SNPs that are drive uh, the specific genetic association, but um, the most likely, in the, when in the absence of other information, most likely source is that they somehow influence the uh, transcription or proteomics of SUMF1 or EMPP6. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about those two genes. First, SUMF1. So SUMF1 encodes the enzyme, formal glycine generating enzyme which is a master activator of lysosomes. It turns on all the sulfatases and lysosomes. So it actually um, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, acts on these sulfatases to activate them. And so when you disrupt them, you get this multiple sulfatase deficiency syndrome. So uh, null, null SUMF1s uh, lead to a, a heritable genetic disorder that has fairly high penetrance early in life and is very serious. Um, the transcript of SUMF1, which our locus is located in, which is not the primary transcript, um, is it is known to be expressed in brain, we've shown that, and encodes uh, an isoform of formoglycin generating enzyme that lacks the active site, the cysteine 341 residue. So it's interesting that if it alters the generation of that um, isoform, it could clearly alter the activity of both the SUMF1 and therefore broadly of lysosomes in our in our individuals, um, but it's unclear to what extent uh, this isoform is actually expressed in tissue anywhere or in brain specifically. Um, when people have knocked down SUMF1 in neurons or astrocytes, um, they see neurodegeneration phenotypes that emerge. And we've, what's interesting is that we, and I'm gonna talk more about this a little bit, we've previously shown that the preservation of synaptic protein levels in people with AD is associated with reducing psychosis risk. So it seems likely that uh, uh, a genetic alteration, if it does indeed influence the activity of lysosomes and lysosomal degradation pathways, could influence risk of psychosis via effects on synaptic protein preservation. So that's an intriguing hypothesis that we want to test. Um, what about EMPP6? EMPP6 is a glycerophosphodiesterase. It's actually a very specific marker of new oligodendrocytes when they differentiate from OPCs, from oligodendrocyte precursors. Um, so it turns on specifically and selectively in new oligodendrocytes. So it points us right to a specific cell type, which is interesting and not and sort of novel in this in the syndrome. Uh, the protein itself is expressed on the myelin membrane and can also be secreted. So what does it do? It's a hydrolase. So it basically severs choline from a variety of substrates. Uh, most prominently, it has its greatest efficiency towards sphingosyl phosphoryl choline. That's a mouthful, right? But it's an important pathway because when you uh, release uh, phosphocholine from that, you get sphingosine, which is then phosphorylated to generate a signaling molecule, sphingosine 1-phosphate, which uh, can signal um, neurons in other cells via uh, sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor, SP1R, S1PR1, excuse me. And so it, that, that really caught our attention because for unrelated reasons, we had previously studied uh, an agent that acts at that receptor, fingolimod. It's currently available for use in multiple sclerosis. And we found that when we gave it to mice uh, who produce uh, overproduce beta amyloid and have uh, a blend of psychotic-like and uh, agitation-like behaviors, that it improved their behavioral uh, output. So. It, that remains an interesting idea about a place where we may be able to develop some targets uh, for therapy. So what else did we see? We did, in addition to these SNP analyses, you can do a whole gene analysis. You can ask, if you look at all the genes in the, across the genome, you look at all the SNPs in each gene, uh, uh, you can see that um, uh, whether individual genes are enriched for SNPs that associate with psychosis risk. So this, these are our top hits of individual genes. What we saw is that APOE is only one of these that pass the threshold for gene-wide significance. <coughs> Excuse me. Tom 40, which is adjacent to APOE, was close. And then a number of other hits here, none of which uh, would survive the, the, the um, multiple hypothesis testing correction, but are, nevertheless, these were the top other genes. The APOE story is interesting um, because there have been a lot of papers published about whether APOE4, epsilon 4 um, haplotypes uh, are associated with psychosis risk for AD. And those papers have been all over the map, positive, negative, positive, negative. So this is the first very large study. And I think we've, at this point, answered the question definitively that APOE epsilon 4 does confer increased risk for psychosis. And what we see here, how do we do that? So this is a plot of all the SNPs on chromosome 19 anywhere in the vicinity of the APOE gene, which is the shaded region in blue here. Um, the dashed line is the location of the APOE4 allele, the SNPs that confer the APOE4 genotype. 
And so what I want to show you is if what this is a plot of now is the significance of all the SNPs in the region if you control for the number of E4 alleles that the individuals contain. So there's a highly significant effect of E4 allele on psychosis rest, E4 allele count. And then when you control for that, all the other SNPs in the area become non-significant. So we think that most of the genetic contribution uh, of APOE to risk for psychosis is about E4 carriers. Rob, um, excuse me, uh, I may have missed it, but um, do the uh, presenilin genes for early onset, do the, are those uh, associated uh, fully or mostly with psychosis? Um, people have not really seen that. Uh, you know, there's not very good data in terms of numbers of cases of people with um, mutation-based AD and rates of psychosis to be clear of any one of those mutations drives increased rates of psychosis, but we did not see the presenilin show up in our common variant study here. Um, whether or not rare variants in presenilin may be enriched in people who are psychotic is not known. No one's done a, a rare variant study yet. Um, and so uh, another thing you can do is you can ask, how does, gen how does a genetic risk for other disorders relate to genetic risk for psychosis in AD? And so we asked this. And so first I'm showing you the genetic risk for um, psychosis in, uh, excuse me, for genetic risk for AD itself. So these are SNPs, you know, SNPs that from large genome-wide association studies of people with AD versus healthy controls, healthy elderly controls. And you can take all SNPs that are high genome-wide significance or SNPs that are just trending or even just most SNPs, SNPs who have a p-value less than 0.5, Regardless of how you do it, what you see is that your risk for AD, your genetic risk, positively inc increases, positively correlates, odds ratios above one, with your risk for psychosis in AD. So there is some overlap between these two genetic, these two conditions. AD genes drive somewhat that worst phenotype of AD plus psychosis, and all these p-values are significant. Um, and that's true even if you leave APOE4 out of it, because I tell you APOE4 is a strong predictor. So even if you leave E4 out, you weaken the effect, but you still see the same direction of effect. That differs from what we see when you look at other traits, whether other traits predict genetically correlate with psychosis risk in AD. So for example, schizophrenia, which you might think would correlate, doesn't, right? There's not a genetic overlap between schizophrenia risk genes and psychosis risk in AD. It's non-significant. The overall correlation is slightly protective. Um, but risk for bipolar disorder or risk for depressive symptoms does correlate with psych significantly with psychosis in AD. Bipolar disorder shows a negative correlation. It's largely protective. And then more interesting, depressive symptoms shows a significant increase, uh, positive correlation, R0.3 and a P less of 0.02. So that's consistent with what a lot of what we know about the clinical correlates of psychosis in AD in which depressive symptoms are elevated in people who are, have psychosis during their Alzheimer's disease. Other phenotypes that might have been related given the cognitive phenotype of psychosis in AD, like, excuse me, intelligence, not related. We do see a correlation that's protective with years of schooling. Again, there's a lot of data that shows that um, years of education is protective against cognitive decline and in many studies protective against psychosis in AD. So this is consistent with those earlier clinical studies. And then if you look at other neurodegenerative diseases that may have overlap with our phenotype, so ALS, um, which is, has as a pathology, pathologic basis, some of the same primary pathologies as frontal temporal dementia, this was a better data set to use, non-significant association, Parkinson's disease, whose um, molecular biology overlaps a lot with Lewy body dementia, and but again, often it's a better genetic data set to use in Lewy body dementia. Again, no significant overlap with psychosis risk in AD. And now, just to illustrate this a little better, I think it's easier to look at starting with the graph on the right. So, this is the beta, which is a measure of the the risk of the set of of a set of SNPs to predict psychosis in AD is on the. Um, x-axis, so higher numbers mean more likely to become psychotic, numbers below zero would mean protective, and each dot is a SNP that's associated with risk for Alzheimer's disease, that significantly predicts Alzheimer's disease, and it's Alzheimer's disease beta is shown here on the y-axis, and so what you can see is there's a direct 
positive correlation between the likelihood that a SNP increases your risk for AD and increases your risk for psychosis in AD. For schizophrenia, the, the story is very different. So these are all the, uh, each point is now a, a SNP that's genome-wide significant for risk of schizophrenia. So they either, this group above and the top increase risk of schizophrenia. This group, the SNP direction is protective against risk of schizophrenia. Um, and you can see that in both groups, there's like every combination. There are genes that are protective for schizophrenia and psychosis and Alzheimer's disease, and genes that increase risk for both. But then there are genes that um, increase risk for schizo uh, reduce risk for schizophrenia and protect against Alzheimer's disease, and vice versa. Genes that increase risk for schizophrenia but protect against al psychosis and Alzheimer's disease. So it's the net effect is null, but that doesn't mean there isn't heterogeneity. There may be some genes that are important to both syndromes and could be relevant um, for mechanisms in both syndromes. Okay. All right, so how do we then think about these in terms of how you get psychotic in AD at a, in your brain at a biologic level? So I'm starting, I should have just started here, sorry. Um, start with this idea of the conventional model for Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis. So you have amyloid first, it to some extent drives uh, hyperphosphorylation and deposition of fibrillar tau. It is also those two things combined really are associated with increased microglial activation uh, with aging. And altogether, they drive neocortical synapse loss, which is the best correlate of subsequent cognitive deterioration. And for people where this whole process is driven more rapidly, become psych through some mechanism, become psychotic. Uh, it's worth pointing out that almost no one has pure Alzheimer's disease. Almost everyone has Lewy body, TDP43, or vascular comorbidities. And these things all contribute uh, independently to the process of presumptively of synapse loss and certainly to uh, cognitive impairment. So anything that inhibits one of these processes could be an indicator of resilience. Converse, anything that drives one of them would be an indicator of, of uh, vulnerability to psychosis. So where do, what do we know about this in the, in the brains of people with psychosis? Well, we wanted to study their brains, but the first thing is to figure out which brains to study. So, um, and so this, this gets uh, to an earlier question you asked, Jeff. Um, this was a uh, data compiled a long time ago from uh, Dil Jesty that showed the prevalence of psychosis in individuals at different stages of cognitive impairment of dementia. So MCI early, uh, middle and late stages. And you see that like really the rapid rise in onset of psychosis is as you progress from mild through the middle stages of disease, and then it kind of flattens out. And I think that that's really important. We wanted to look in brains that were in these stages of disease where the action is happening. We don't want to see the tail end of psychosis. We want to see what's causing it to, to emerge. Um, so to do that, we took advantage of the fact that you can map these mid these mini mental state scores to a pathologic measure that's present in the brain, the Brock stage, which is a measure of tau pathology. And you can see that these middle stages of, that we're interested in, which are this blue shaded region, are people who are in Brock stages three through five. Brock stage six is an end stage, not of great interest, and earlier Brock stages are really preclinical. So this is a group we focused on in our postmortem tissue studies. So this is the cohort we initially compiled, 140 individuals um, matched on age, sex, postmortem interval, uh, age of onset, duration of illness, Brock stage, and APOE4 positivity. Um, and I'm going to talk to you now about a series of studies using this cohort or subsets of this cohort. We didn't always have all subjects in every one of the studies. And I'll take you through what our findings were. Uh, the first report of this was uh, by a uh, very talented say, now psychiatry resident in our group, Josh Kravinko, a couple of years ago. So the first thing we did is we took these 140 brains, we took uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex from these individuals because it's a brain region that is impacted in psychosis and AD. It's not unique. Generally, psychosis and AD impacts the neocortex broadly, not so much the hippocampus, which seems to be uh, affected both in psychotic and non-psychotic individuals with AD equally. So we looked in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and we stained all these cases for a number of markers and then quantitated the stain. So we stained them for a marker of um, uh, 
fibrillar hyperphosphorylated tau, PHF1, oligomeric tau, amyloid beta, and then two microglial markers that measure microglial abundance and microglial activation here. And after we did all the staining, we used uh, automated image segmentation to generate estimates of the proportion of the cortex volume that contain the pathology of interest. And then those we use those estimates plus measures of Lewy body pathology, TDP43 pathology, and vascular pathology that were uh, semi-quantitative uh, to examine, did any of these predict risk of psychosis and AD in this cohort? And what we saw is something, um, our major finding, the, it was that uh, tau air volume fraction, this, in this case, uh, PHF1 positive tau uh, deposits were significantly associated with an increased risk of psychosis. This, is, this replicates in a lot of studies which have shown that there is an increased tau burden in people who develop psychosis during AD. Um, we also saw that there was an association a TDP43 pathology. We have seen these in some studies, but in other studies, it's less consistent, so I'm less certain about this. And we saw um, that there was an increased ratio of activated microglia, excuse me, a decreased ratio of uh, activated micro microglia in the psychotic group. Uh, and then we saw, surprisingly, because other opposite reports have been described, uh, we saw that elevated vascular pathology predicted a lower rate of psychosis in AD. But I think the most important thing about this is if you measure comprehensively all the pathologies, at least in the DLPFC, we accounted for 18% of the variance of psychosis occurrence, which means there's a lot of other biology going on besides neuropathology that's responsible for the risk. Uh, Rob, this yes. brings back uh, memories of Blessed Tomlinson and Roth a little bit. Um, yeah. But so you're finding, apart from the individual types of uh, neuropathology, that there's sort of a, uh, a positive correlation between amount and likelihood of psychosis, and it's mainly located in frontal cortices? So, yeah, so this was based on studies limited to frontal cortices. And yes, if for, for PHF1, and it's about amount, and same for HLA-DR to IPA1 ratio, TD43 is strictly a yes or no, did you have this comorbidity? And for these, for the vascular counts, it is a, it's a, um, it is an amount, but it's not uh, an unbiased amount. It's just sort of semi-quantitative rating from like, you know, none, some, you know, moderate, severe. So, so I don't want to get ahead of your talk, but um, have you speculated or experimentally taken that, you know, to mechanistically, uh, uh, whether these um, neuropathologic uh, findings are, are, uh, are related to um, any any particular uh, uh, neuro uh, chemical neurotransmission system, and whether it's influencing dopamine, glutamate, GABA, anything that leads to how psychosis would evolve from these um, toxic uh, protein aggregations. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do see, but we have not looked at selective neuro, um, monoamine transmitter systems. So uh, in this study, I mean, a long time ago, I looked a little bit at striatal dopamine levels. We didn't see, or indices of striatal dopamine uh, and dopamine receptors. We didn't see a lot in for the AD psychosis finding there. Um, but let me talk about this. Uh, so with only, so let me, Building from the fact that only 18% of the variance was accounted for by all the neuropathologies, we did want to ask what's next. I think Jeff, you're setting me up for that. What we did is then a proteomic study, where in this one, which was a targeted proteomic study, we looked at 100 and, uh, fairly precise measures of 190 proteins that were selected because they're enriched in, in synapses. Um, but they weren't selected to be specific. Matter of fact, in many of the monoamine synapses are not included because they're not as prevalent as the glutamatergic and GABAergic synapses. So these are um, 190 proteins. It's a subset of that prior group. This is the characteristics of this subset. And then what I want you to see here, this is what was very intriguing, is that on this graph is the ratio of the mean value for each of the 190 proteins in, in non-psychotics over to the ratio of the same mean value for the psychotic subjects. And you can see that obviously in the log two scale, so zero reflects an identical you know, ratio of one. Everything here to the right is indicates that these 
synaptic proteins had higher levels, mean levels in the non-psychotic group, to the left would be higher levels in the psychotic group. We can see there's this dramatic shift to the right of, so you can think of it as either synaptic protein level preservation in non-psychotics or synaptic protein vulnerability in psychotic individuals. It was striking. Now, we've subsequently gone on to a, now a subset of 80 subjects that overlaps with this and the larger group to look at RNA-seq from the same, again, all this is from the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, uh, transcript levels. And we started by asking about the transcript levels for these 190 proteins. We were able to identify uh, the transcripts for um, uh, not all of the 190, but I think it was uh, 160 some odd, 163 genes. So for those 163 transcripts, what we see is the exact same effect. There's this um, increase in transcript expression level in the non-psychotic group overall. So it looks, at first glance, it looks like there's an upregulation of a variety of synaptic proteins that is protective against psychosis or a failure of, of generation of these, these transcripts and proteins in the psychotic group. But this isn't going to prove to be the whole story because we did RNA-seq. We had the right, we um, had some other things where we had to estimate. Um, and just to, I'm sorry, I told you it was a, that this was an overlapping subset. So if we actually limit the, this graph to the same people and the same exact 163 proteins as we see in this graph, we can see the effect did hold up. So this is legitimate. Now, we could look at what's the relationship between those two for the, so now we have the synaptic transcript levels versus the synaptic protein levels for the 163 uh, proteins and genes. And you can see that there's a very modest correlation. So synaptic transcript does associate with, with level of synaptic protein, but the R is small. It's, it accounts for a small portion of the variance. That's not unusual in bulk tissue studies. We were able to use the rest of the genome, the transcriptome, excuse me, to ask what else is going on in these individuals. And you can use transcripts to like estimate proportions of different cell types across the, your cortical region. What we saw is that doing that, that there was a um, decrease in purple here is the psychotic group in like excitatory neurons, glutamatergic neuron proportion. It's about a 10% decrease, 9% decrease in psychosis. Um, and there was also uh, an increase, as, uh, I don't remember actually the percentage of oligodendrocytes in psychosis. Uh, this, keep this in mind, this kind of maps onto that earlier genetic finding for EMPP6. And then lastly, you can ask, what happens if you count, you know, we have a lot of synaptic proteins, but we're losing excitatory neurons. If you account for the excitatory neurons, does that split loss? Does that explain why your synaptic transcripts differ? And the answer is yes. If you adjust transcript levels for cell type proportions, now you see that you're centered on zero and there's really no effect. So we think that the um, same way, this positive correlation disappears when you adjust for excitatory neuron proportion. So we think that there is excitatory neuron loss that's excess in psychotic individuals with AD, and that results in a reduction in transcript abundance and to some extent a reduction in protein abundance, synaptic protein and transcript abundance. Now we also looked at the rest of the transcriptome, and this is all data, I apologize, it's now just under review currently uh, from one of my graduate students, Michael Marks. And if you look at the rest of the transcriptome, there are a large number of nominally significantly uh, differentially expressed genes, either um, up in more expressed in psychotic or more expressed in non-psychotic, uh, nominal defined by P less than 0.05. No single gene beats multiple uh, hypothesis testing cutoffs. And then if you look, if you um, take this group, uh, the entire group of genes and do network analysis and ask, are there different, significantly differentially expressed uh, co-regulated, co-expressed gene networks, you see a number of path, uh, gene networks arrive and pathways that emerge from those gene networks. And so you see um, genes that target protein ubiquitination, unfolded protein response, um, if I, uh, EIF2 signaling and, and ER stress, these are all post-transcriptional mechanisms of protein quality control and protein abundance. 
So we think there's a signal in the rest of the transcriptome for genetic for uh, gene expression factors that alter um, post transcriptional protein abundance. We think that that that's a mechanism of vulnerability of psychosis in AD. So now I'm going to summarize because I know we're getting to the end of the time and the questions. And I know I told you a lot. Um, so first of all, psychosis is frequent in Alzheimer's disease where its occurrence denotes a more severe phenotype. The risk or resilience to psychosis in Alzheimer's disease is genetically determined. And at this point, there are three um, uh, genome-wide or gene-wide significant candidate genes identified in PP6, SUMF1, APOE4, and others that are suggestive. We see that there are synaptic protein deficits present uh, in psychosis and Alzheimer's disease, and that those seem to arise from post-transcriptional mechanisms, um, though also from perhaps loss of neurons. I'm sorry, I didn't include that here. Loss of excitatory neurons. And uh, maybe amongst the post-transcriptional mechanisms, there could be a role for SUMF1 and lysosomal uh, degradation. Finally, both cell proportion analysis and the GWAS hit on ENPP6 suggest a role for oligodendrocyte function or pathology in psychosis and AD, but that's yet to be elaborated. And so just to give you a sense of next steps, we're going to try and further elaborate the genetic mechanisms, both by expanding the number of people in the current GWAS to get more hits, as well as looking at whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing data uh, that's available that we've started to analyze. Um, we're collaborating with groups in the, at the Kellis Lab at MIT, doing single cell RNA-seq and attack-seq of psychotic and non-psychotic AD brain tissue, as well as um, uh, the Lunin Lab, at Katie Lunin and her group at Exeter, who are doing bulk tissue, prefrontal cortex bulk tissue, genomics, methylomics, and RNA-seq to try and develop, again, an integrative uh, genomic profile of the risk for psychosis in AD. Um, we're working in my lab to identify sources of the synaptic protein deficits. We're currently in the midst of a much larger unbiased proteomic screen of both gray matter homogenate synaptosomes and PSDs from uh, cases and controls and are engaging in some targeted SUMF1 proteomic and uh, uh, we'll soon start up some knockout studies to understand its role. And finally, we're concurrently in my lab looking at in PP6 and oligodendrocytes, both by looking at whether there are lipid, i.e. phosphocholine lipid changes uh, associated with psychosis in AD and whether they relate to MPP6 levels and activity and how uh, manipulating MPP6 in model systems um, affects both the, the protein and, uh, and ultimately the lipidomic profile uh, and whether it recapitulates any of the profile of, of psychosis in AD. All right, that's a mouthful. This is the people who helped me do all this. I'll point out a couple of people in particular. Uh, my coordinator, Elise Weimer, uh, and my wife, Marianne D. Michelle, who helped me run all the genetic studies. Uh, the, um, uh, the psychiatry resident I mentioned, Josh Kravinko, who's done all the synaptic proteome work, and uh, the graduate student, Michael Marxison, who did the transcriptome work, and then Matt McDonald here, very talented, a young scientist I work with who is our proteomics uh, expert who helped with all this. And then this is the rest of the lab doing who work uh, more on schizophrenia and other related projects. Um, and I'll just point out my collaborators at the on this project, both Oscar Lopez, the director of our Alzheimer's Center, Bernie Devlin, uh, the genetic uh, anal analyst I work with on these projects, who's been a key collaborator, the director of our genomics, Coralius Cambo, my collaborators from uh, Barcelona, Augustin, uh, Luis, and Marseille. Uh, Richard Mayer, run, I work with on the NIA family study. Um, our neuropathologist, Julia Kofler, who did all the neuropathology work on the cohort I showed you. Um, and this is my general slide. So a lot of these other people are my collaborators for schizophrenia, but Ying Ding, who's our proteomics analyst extraordinaire. Um, and maybe some of you know my chair, Dr. Lewis, who just has helped provide us with access to tissue and other things through the years. And I think I'll stop there and we'll have a time to open it up to questions. Well, thanks, uh, Rob. That's a great uh, talk. And 
a good overview of sort of the genetics of the neuropathology such as they are. Um, I'm gonna um, begin just by asking a question because I have to unfortunately leave to another meeting and Terry Goldberg is gonna moderate the rest of the discussion. But um, uh, so I have two questions. Um, one is uh, very practical as apropos what we were talking about before about masks and COVID and infectious uh, respiratory infections. Um, do antipsychotics uh, uh, harm or help people with agitation and psychosis? Um, so they clearly reduce the burden of agitation symptoms and, and psychotic symptoms. So when people have studied them in trials of just psychotic symptoms, they haven't been efficacious. But in trials of mixed symptoms, they're clearly efficacious and they can prevent relapse and recurrence. And there's been a lot of work and a lot of studies that have shown that um, compared to placebo. Of course, they have a real, a tough side effect profile that's even tougher in the elderly. So, uh, so for example, in the KD study, when people have asked, you know, do the net benefit, there's no net benefit, sort of the, the people who get side effects and have to drop out are offset almost exactly the people who get benefit. Um, but then if you look at other studies and uh, Devanand and your department has done like really elegant work on discontinuation studies in nursing home, you see that if you stop this, people get sick again. So they have a role. Okay, um, I've, I, I sort of figured as much, which is uh, we don't have anything better. And even though it's not clearly therapeutic, uh, uh, it's better than maybe using nothing. Um, so the second question is, so, um, and this is what I was trying to, uh, asked before when you were describing the results of the um, uh, uh, the DP, uh, DFPLC findings. Um, so you, you have individuals that in the course of their dementia develop psychotic symptoms and you uh, find that they have more uh, concentrations of tau or amyloid um, and they have a reduction in excitatory neurons, which I presume are mostly the pyramidal cells and they also have uh, a lesser effect on the inhibitory cells, which are likely the inner neurons. Mm -hmm. um, so how does that lead to psychosis? There is a good question. <laughs> um, I don't think we know what, what causes psychosis. I'll give you my thinking about it. How's that? Um, yep. So I think that, so first of all, I think psychosis, whether we're talking about schizophrenia or we're talking about Alzheimer's disease or other dementias, is a joint phenotype. It's like a cognitive and psychotic phenotype. It is this joint liability. And in Alzheimer's disease, you see people who have um, what I would call low fidelity, either memory or low fidelity uh, sensory you know, perceptions, and then layer on a psychotic you know, interpretation. I don't know why they latch onto it. So I think there's a piece of it, and I think the same may be true in schizophrenia. We certainly know schizophrenia have a lot of low fidelity sensory uh, functions. So there may be a piece of it that there's a, I'm guessing that a lot of the biology we're looking at is addressing the question of fidelity of the cognitive or sensory processes. I don't know what causes you then to, um, to latch onto an incorrect interpretation and hold on to it. That one I'm less clear about. That's, 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 that's a great answer, and it, it really relates to um, you know Kapoor's original uh, proposal about uh, affecting salience mechanisms, and Guillermo Horga here has a, um, a model which involves um, you know the way that uh, we invest various sensory stimuli with meaning and and so forth. So um, I guess that's as much as we know at this point. Uh, Terry, over to you. And Rob, can you hear me well? Yeah, I can, Terry, thanks. Sure, great talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna moderate what follows and I'll read some of the questions, but first I have, I'm gonna take advantage of this role and ask you a couple of questions of my sure. own. One is, did you create a polygenic risk score for psychosis in AD using the large sample that you worked with? And if so, how successful was it in explaining genetic variants? Let's say using your 7 million SNPs. Yeah. Um, give or take one or two. We, yeah, we did. You don't use all 7 million. You know, you take different cuts through it. 
we did, it did not explain a lot of the variance. And right now I, a, that number's in the paper and I don't have it in the top of my head, but it's a small percent. Um, we are, you know, for explaining polygenic risk, we're just underpowered at 12,000 people. You see that, you know, the, the, the power in these go up, like you gotta get into the 50 to 100,000, I think range to get really good power. Yeah, and then my second question, Rob, has to do with the high frequency of visual hallucinations in Alzheimer's disease and also in other neurodegenerative conditions. And what do you make of that vis-a-vis -vis schizophrenia and also vis-a-vis -vis how little schizophrenia genetics seem to uh, impact Alzheimer's disease psychosis? Sure. So I want to, so um, the high prevalence of visual hallucinations. So in Alzheimer's disease, visual hallucinations run probably 15 to 20% of individuals have them reported. I want to estimate, I'm going to tell you, I think that's probably an overestimate because it's mostly reported by families and they're not always so good at telling who had a hallucination versus who thought there was someone there, like, but never saw, never literally saw them in front of them. Uh, in some of the other disorders like dementia with Lewy bodies, the prevalence is much higher. It can be even as high as you know, 70 or 80 percent or higher. Um, and uh, we know in that condition, there is a lot, there's an accentuation of posterior cortical atrophy. So posterior cortical atrophy syndromes, and there are other examples of that, like, um, uh, oh, I'm gonna have a senior moment, whatever, the Binet syndrome, uh, what's, the, what's the first name? <laughs> uh, but in any event, uh, Posterior cortical atrophy syndromes have high rates of visual hallucination. So one of the implications may be that a difference between a neurodegenerative disorder, which can target the posterior cortex and schizophrenia is that the neurodevelopmental timing of schizophrenia is such that it places at risk um, auditory cortex, say, over visual cortex. And that would be um, certainly consistent with at least that aspect of schizophrenia, which has adolescent onset where auditory cortex and, and auditory association areas are still developing through early adolescence into early adulthood like the frontal cortex, whereas the visual cortex is not so much developing still at that point in time. Okay, so let me start with a question from the audience. William Tucker asks, is it possible that the rapid decline of cognitive function itself produces the psychosis as a kind of compensation? I think it's a great question. And I, I think it is possible. Um, there, I've wondered about that often. Is it rate of change in cognition that causes that emergence in psychosis? And I think I wonder about the same thing in schizophrenia too. We know that many people with schizophrenia are experiencing cognitive deterioration around the time of, of onset of symptoms, not just not just sort of a failure to elaborate cognitive function, but some deteriorating. So I've wondered about that. It's certainly a possibility. I don't, hard to figure out how to disambiguate it. I will say this, we did one study um, where we looked at people who at year 10 of follow-up did or did not have psychosis when assessed and all of whom were normal when they entered the study and every year had cognitive testing on a global test, the 3MS. It was a population study, the, the cardiovascular health study. And what we saw is that when you plotted the, the trajectory of the cognitive decline, the trajectory of the people who 10 years later would be psychotic when in their AD was already was by year two or three when they were still normal, was already diverging, was more rapidly downhill. So I think, so I don't know if the decline causes the psychosis as an element of you know compensation or but the decline seems to precede the onset psychosis. So I think of the psychosis as a late marker of a more rapidly downhill course. It, it, it follows the decline in any event. So decline could cause it itself. Elizabeth Guthrie uh, states that she works with children, but she has a question about the protection conferred by advanced edu education. Is there any research assessing whether factors that contribute to not pursuing higher levels of education um, such as learning issues, contribute to your findings. And I, I guess that relates in some way to cognitive reserve. Yeah, yeah. So um, 
Elizabeth, I, uh, I think you have more experts in your institution on cognitive reserve and how it may impact risk for, for um, uh, Alzheimer's disease or Alzheimer's psychosis than I have. It's a really complicated, messy area because obviously ed years of education is not a good proxy for intelligence or cognitive reserve. It's, it's, it's a proxy, but it's not a great one because social and other factors influence your likelihood of pursuing years of education. And people can be very, very smart and contribute, continue to learn throughout life, but not have gone far in school. So um, it's a bit, it is a bit of a mess, but there is a consistent story across years of Alzheimer's literature that various indices of intellectual attainment, one of which is years of education, are protective against Alzheimer's disease. I think uh, the most striking example may have been the early reports uh, from the Nun study that showed that like 20 year olds, um, the level of complexity of their grammatical usage of sentences and, and their written uh, applications to join the, the nunnery uh, were predictive of their risk of Alzheimer's disease years later. Okay. Uh, Ted Huey compliments you on a fantastic talk and then asks whether you see any neuropath differences within the frontal lobe such that psychosis in AD is associated specifically with prognopathies targeted frontal regions. So um, the, the prognopathies that target the frontal lobes to some extent preferentially a little bit a beta, which tends to you know accumulate early in the frontal lobes. It's not specific to the frontal lobes. Um, TDP forty three, which is frontal temporal, and then some of the unusual tauopathies, which will target the frontal lobes. So we we didn't have anyone in our group who had any of those unusual tauopathies, like uh, uh, tau based frontal temporal lobe dementia, uh, dementia, or in the other, or FUS, or anything that was a clearly a frontal temporal lobe dementia. We have people with AD, so they can have TDP43 comorbidity, so they have the pathology. Um, we, in this particular paper I talked about, the 2018 paper, we saw an excess of TDP43 positivity, not necessarily in the frontal lobes, but it's anywhere in the brain of those individuals. Um, what, uh, but we have had other studies where we didn't see it, and so I, I'm not entirely sure if it was a, an artifact of just sample selection or if TDP43 uh, um, inclusion accrual really contributes, but we didn't necessarily see it in the frontal lobes per se of these individuals. Terry, you're muted. Dev Devanan asks uh, if you think that the genetic profile uh, that you elucidated should be considered in predicting which patients with AD uh, are likely to develop psychosis and I would add that would be of important prognostic, uh, an important prognostic indicator. Yeah. So I can give you a, an empiric answer. So we looked at that question, we haven't published this yet, in about 700 or 800 individuals who we entered our clinic with MCI or AD and who were not psychotic at the time they came in, but, and then some of whom went on to develop incident psychosis. And we did not see that our genetic risk score, the PRS, was able to predict um, it just marginally, you know, approached significance as a predictor of, of time to psychosis onset and completely disappeared as a predictor if you accounted for very basic clinical factors like mini mental or CDR at time of, uh, uh, of entry to the study. Um, I, I think some of that relates to the fact that, as I mentioned in the answer to Terry's question earlier, you know, with 12,000 people, only a couple of things that actually have already passed genome wide significance, we don't have a very strong genetic predictor yet. And if we're at 60,000 people, and maybe if we get to a couple of hundred of genome-wide significant and several thousand other trending SNPs, maybe we'll have a strong enough predictor to be useful clinically. Um, I'll make one of the case, one of the point, which is these are common variants we're testing with SNPs. A lot of Alzheimer's risk, including late onset Alzheimer's risk, seems to be contributed by rare variants. So it's possible that when we start our rare variant studies, we will find other genetic variants that are that help improve our prediction. Very good. And it looks like the last question is from David Forrest. And that is, how do you explain the use of the Pimbanserin in PD and ADPD? Um, 
strong marketing. <laughs> um, no. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, no, I mean, uh, I'm being facetious there. So we, I mean, so work, so I want to say for years, there was lots of work um, really that wrapped up around the time I was entering the field of geriatric psychiatry that showed that conventional antipsychotics with a variety of broad profiles, D2 blockers, but other, other you know, serotonergic blockade was efficacious relative to placebo in reducing agitation and psychosis in people with AD. There have been in the era of the um, atypical antipsychotics, uh, similar data for many of them, uh, not, not for all of them, but certainly uh, clear data for risperidone, um, uh, reasonable data, um, uh, well, a good data set for risperidone, let's just say that, but others show, show evidence of efficacy. And so the problem is that the elderly are much more likely with conventional antipsychotics to develop Parkinsonism and TD, and Parkinsonism can be fatal in an elderly person if it causes them, for example, to fall, break a hip, et cetera. Um, and so there, the, with the evidence that the atypicals were efficacious, there was a reasonable thought, like maybe the D2 blockade's the least important thing and we could get an agent that just has some of the serotonin receptor blockade and be useful. And hence, they went to the drugs like Pimavancerin that were largely serotonergic blockers and were able to show some efficacy and they wanted to use them in PD, obviously to avoid dopaminergic blockade. It's not clear to me how strongly efficacious they are in those syndromes. I don't treat those disorders and I have not taken to using them in my AD cases because I find that the current array of much less expensive, typically conventional, uh, atypical antipsychotics uh, provide usually enough uh, benefit. And I, I should say on therapy, there's, there's also a reasonable body of evidence for a couple of the SSRIs for um, citalopram and for sertraline to have some efficacy against psychosis and AD. And those obviously have a good safety tolerability profile. Great. And Marshall I asks, uh, or says, knowing that infections can cause psychosis in older adults, uh, is this being compared to genetic predispositions? In other words, are people with certain genetics more likely to have uh, this reaction when they get an infection? And do you feel that clinicians uh, know how to recognize an infection um, that could lead to psychosis? So, um, sure. So, for people who don't do geriatrics, they wouldn't be aware, but like a, a good rule of thumb is you have a change in mental state to develop psychotic symptoms or agitation in an elderly person. You do a few things, one of which is urinalysis or urine culture. It's not uncommon that very mild infections can cause a change in mental state in people with dementia. Uh, we made an effort in all of our studies to exclude from the people we categorized as psychotic, those people whose psychotic symptoms only clearly arose in the context of a medical condition. So people who only had symptoms in or around an acute hospitalization, we discounted if they didn't have them uh, outside of that setting. Obviously, when you, we don't know everyone who might've had a, a mild unrecognized UTI or something that caused a change of state. But most of the most of our individuals with psychosis have symptoms that are recurrent over time. Uh, that's a criteria that actually um, I kind of lifted from work from Devanon that suggested that you know these things need to be persistent and recurrent over the course of weeks and the months to be likely to, to indicate a psychotic syndrome that'd be less likely due to an acute infection. Um, having said that, as the genetics emerges, we may get leads as people have in Alzheimer's disease more generally to the fact that, and in schizophrenia that the genes point to the immune system. So it would not be far-fetched to think that we might find leads to immune system genes and things that are implicated in some common infections. Uh, it's a, I think it's plausible. I don't, I can't speak to it uh, too, spe too specifically at this point though about the, whether the biology indicates it. I guess, Rob, I would add as an addendum that often in, in the context of an acute effect, infection, the, the diagnostics point to delirium. And 
you know, delirium in an outpatient setting is probably under-recognized and underappreciated. Yeah, thank you. That's absolutely true. And I, I think that was a little bit my point is we made an effort to try and identify people who had a psychotic syndrome and not just a delirium episode or potentially recurrent delirium episodes. But in the outpatient setting, some of those would be missed. Um, it is a tricky, there are also individuals with uh, psychotic presentations of dementia, more common, I think, in Lewy body disease, where there's a lot of fluctuation, where it's pretty hard to tell whether they have a psychosis associated with a cognitive disorder or they have a chronic delirium of some sort that you can't identify a source for. I think that's it for the questions, Rob. Um, of course, we would very much like to thank you for the great presentation and uh, your very thoughtful answers to uh, the issues that uh, the audience brought up. So that's it, Simon, unless you have any further words about uh, CME credits, I think we'll call it a day. Yeah, you're good to go. All right, thank Thanks you so again. much for having me, it was a lot of fun. With pleasure. Yep, good seeing you, Terry.